So uh, with us today, uh, I'm, I'm just so excited, uh, is, here we go. He's down here. We're going to find him. Ah, Daniel Ganser, PhD, a Swiss historian who heads the Swiss Institute for Peace and Energy Research. He's widely known for his research into post-World War II stay-behind armies in Europe. In his 2005 book, NATO's Secret Armies, Operation Gladio, and Terrorism in Western Europe, Ganser marshals the evidence that these secret forces worked closely with NATO and the CIA, and that Italian Gladio units carried out false flag terror attacks against the Italian civilians, with the blame being pinned on the political left. His studies also focused on the global struggle for oil and on the covert warfare, resources wars, and economic policy. His new book on U.S. imperialism was published in April of 2020 and sold more than 40,000 copies in just three months. The book's available in German. He's still looking for a U.S. publisher to publish it in English. So if you have any ideas about that, we want to talk to him. Now, speaking of him, hello, Daniel. Hello, Richard. Awesome. So awesome to see you again. We spoke in Switzerland together uh, and yeah. throughout Europe. It was incredible. At the time, I'll never forget. We raised a lot of awareness. And what was your experience of that? I just um, I'm very grateful that you guys in the U.S. carry out this uh, research. It's really important, not only for the U.S., for Europe as well and the entire world. I'm, I'm now based in Switzerland and uh, I'm very happy that I can participate in this conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming. It's it's just amazing uh, to have you here. Hey, Daniel, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to you, my friend, and yep. uh, we're going to see the important information uh, that you have to share with us. Uh, here goes. Take it away, my friend. Thanks very much, Richard. I uh, prepared a few slides, obviously, starting with the picture we all know very well, terrorist attacks of 9-11, uh, 19 years ago. Um, I'm not going to go into the details because I'm not an architect, but I want to say that we know as historians that you can create fear. And if you look at these people here, this is a picture taken in New York on the day of the attacks, then you know that it is always something which, which has an effect on the population. And I have, uh, in my research, always been interested in this topic, politics of fear. How can you, how can you move people around uh, if, you, if you increase the fear? And uh, this has been done many times. It's not an accident. It is something that has happened um, many times. And the thing that I'm interested in as a historian is how can you then use this fear to actually start a war? And uh, the evidence is very clear that you can use that. You create fear in a population. You blame um, the the fear and on, on or the terror on somebody else, and then you can actually wage a, a war against that country. Other, otherwise, the population wouldn't be ready to attack that other country. Um, I'm very happy, as I said already, that uh, architects and engineers uh, carry out this important research on on the terrorist attacks of 9/11, especially on World Trade Center 7. I discussed this here in Switzerland with the experts of architecture, design, and, and, and um, they, they clearly said to me, uh, the building has been brought down uh, through controlled demolition, World Trade Center 7. And I'm, I'm convinced that this is actually the case. Uh, that's what happened. But I want to leave the United States and, and go with you to Afghanistan, because Afghanistan was the country which was attacked uh, within a few weeks after 9-11. It was actually on 7 October 2001 that the United States forces attacked Afghanistan. Um, uh, the claim was Osama bin Laden was responsible for 9-11 and he was in Afghanistan and therefore the war was justified. That's what the Bush, Bush administration said. But if we go into the details and if we look especially at the pictures, um, this, is a, this is a family from Afghanistan. Then, then we realize that people in Afghanistan are basically very, very poor. And it is, it is it's quite insane that these people are being killed and bombed and, 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 and killed for something which they clearly haven't done. I mean, they 
if you look at that boy and, and his father, they, they clearly didn't blow up World Trade Center 7. They, they didn't have the means, they were not there. So um, this war against Afghanistan is still going on and now already 19 years is one of the longest wars uh, the United States has been fighting and also Germany, which is next to uh, Switzerland. I'm, I'm based here in Switzerland and, and, and German soldiers are also fighting in Afghanistan and many of the German uh, soldiers come to my talks and, uh, and they listen because they want to know why are we in Afghanistan. And really it is politics of fear, okay? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a shock uh, that happened on 9-11 and then the war against Afghanistan was actually pinned to it. Started on 7 October 2001, less than three weeks after 9-11. But it was not limited to Afghanistan. Um, the um, so-called war on terrorism then soon spread to Iraq, here uh, marked in uh, green on the map. And US forces then deployed to Iraq. And obviously, um, you, can, you can ask yourself, why, why did the United States attack Iraq? Uh, because it's according to the United Nations Charter, it's illegal to attack another country if you know Afghanistan had... Um, invaded United States or if Iraq had invaded United States in 2003 it would have been illegal and and the same is uh, is true for 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 US invasion of Iraq in 2003 the UN charter uh, says very cl clearly um all nations uh, that's a quote all nations shall refrain from the use of force in their international affairs um so at that time, President Bush, who was also in charge uh, in 2001 during 9-11, uh, he said, we must attack Iraq because of the weapons of mass destruction that they are in Iraq. Later, it was shown that that was a lie. There were no weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq. But still, U.S. soldiers who were fighting in Iraq and who were killing people in Iraq, um, they, were, they were convinced that they were doing the right thing, many of them and asked in 2006, so three years after the invasion, um, the soldiers, US soldiers in, 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 in Iraq were, were asked, why are they here? And 85% of them said their main mission was to retaliate for Saddam's role in the September 11 attacks. And you know, this really, this is really very, very sad, okay? Um, because um, Saddam Hussein, so he was the president of Iraq, um, clearly a brutal dictator, no doubt about that. But Saddam Hussein had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. But the corporate media just always linked 9-11 and Saddam Hussein always again and again and again. And so these soldiers were actually brainwashed, um, invaded a country they didn't know, they killed people they didn't know. And uh, they actually, as you can see on the slide, um, painted, uh, painted the, the Twin Towers and the uh, Pentagon on their helmets. They didn't paint uh, World Trade Center 7. Most of them were probably not even aware of World Trade Center 7, which is not hit by a plane and collapsed on 9-11, on as, as we all know here. But what I wanted to stress here is that politics of fear has a, has a very real effect on soldiers, on officers, and, and obviously of people in the countries that were invaded. Um, and we know that this, this is just... Um, very, very sad. Um, it is obviously not the first uh, war that was based on lies, the Iraq war. Um, many, many other wars were also based on lies. I just want to give you one example. Um, here is the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam, a country in Southeast Asia here uh, pictured in, uh, in green. And um, um, so uh, Vietnam borders China, and you see that there's the so-called Gulf of Tonkin. Um, the map here is in German because I usually speak German, sorry for that, but it says Gulf von Tonkin in, in English, Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, um, the story in 1964 was um, that in that Gulf of Tonkin, a U.S. ship, USS Maddox, was attacked by Vietnam, and therefore that Vietnam started that war. Um, then U.S. soldiers, who most of whom had never, never left the United States before, had never been to Vietnam, were sent to Vietnam and, you know, were told, you, you have to fight there, these are evil people, these are all communists, you have to kill them. And we had massacres like the My Lai Massacre, um, we had 58,000 U.S. soldiers killed and we had around 3 million um, Vietnamese killed. And the very sad thing um, that as a historian I have to point out is that also the Vietnam War was based on lies. 
the incident in, in the Gulf of Tonkin never happened. It never happened in the way that President Johnson, you know, claimed. Um, in 2005, uh, the National Security Agency um, has declassified formerly top secret documents on the Gulf of Tonkin incident uh, of, of August 1964. And, you know, the story at the time was, um, I showed this ship on, on, on my slide. This is the USS Maddox. And Johnson, President Johnson at the time said there were repeated attacks on this ship. And that's not true. It's simply not true. Uh, Robert Hanyuk, who, who wrote the NSA um, history, uh, really makes it clear that no, there was no second attack on the USS Maddox on, on August 4, 1964. And this is really, really a far-reaching conclusion. It, it just means that the Vietnam War was based on lies. And I know this is very sad, you know, even for people who died there on both sides, US soldiers, Vietnamese people, and it's just very sad. But I want to educate people um, to understand that wars are very often based on lies. It's not an exception. And um, obviously, 9-11 led to the war in Afghanistan and, uh, it's therefore very important that we, we look very, very critically at 9-11 at because it really is embedded in a, in a wider historical context. Um, just um, another country, I, I sort of jump with you through the world a little bit, but that is maybe, you know, widening the, the, the perspective of the audience. Um, uh, many people know that to the south of the United States, you have Cuba, a very small island. Well, small, you know, compared to the United States. It's a big island if you compare it to Switzerland always depends on, on, on how large the country is uh, that you live in. But uh, Cuba um, was invaded by the United States in 1961. Um, uh, the idea was um, uh, to overthrow Fidel Castro here uh, in the picture shown with uh, Che Guevara, um, uh, because um, they really didn't want him there in the government in Havana, which is the capital of Cuba. Now. What they did is they, they, they used bombers and flew over Cuba and bombed the country. These were the bombers. These are old bombers, not used anymore today. This is the B-26 bomber of the U.S. Air Force. And as you can see, painted on the Air Force, there's the sign of the U.S. Air Force, okay? The white star, um, uh, and this is, this is obviously the normal painting. If you, if, if you use the, this plane for, for, a, for an American operation, but this operation was carried out by the CIA, by the Central Intelligence Agency, and the CIA said, gee, um, we, have to, we have to pretend that these planes are planes of the Cuban Air Force. So what they did was a so-called false flag operation. They just painted the, um, the planes differently. They used American planes, but they, they painted them in the, in the colors of the Cubans. And Fidel Castro shot down one of these planes. This is an original picture. And if you look, um, so this is a picture of, a, of an American plane downed in Cuba in 61. And if you look at the, at the tail of the plane, it says F-A-R. And if you look at the, uh, of the, at the flag, it's the Cuban flag. And this is, uh, this is just a trick, you know, that's the trick that the military uses sometimes and also the secret services. They just paint the wrong, the wrong name. <laughs> they paint the wrong name on the plane, okay? Uh, I have this to illustrate it. Uh, F-A-R means Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias, which is um, Spanish and it basically means uh, Armed uh, Forces of Cuba, and then the Cuban flag. So they just painted this, um, uh, on the plane, and actually the normal plane was like that. It was an American plane. They painted it uh, like that, and just to make to make a story. The story then was that Cuban pilots um, had left the dictatorship uh, of Fidel Castro. They were so disgusted this, with Fidel Castro that they left the country, and before leaving the country, they bombed their own country. So that was the story. I mean, it was just a lie. But I just want to give you these um, details that... Um, people who are maybe not very familiar with secret warfare, that they understand what the term false flag means. False flag is if you just put up a false flag, not the right flag, and uh, try to confuse the enemy. It's being done very many, it's many times in, in military history. Now, um, let me take you to Italy. Uh, capital of Italy is Rome. Switzerland is just based uh, to the north uh, of Italy. So I, I know the country very well. I speak the language, I speak Italian. 
And uh, as part of my PhD, I researched terrorist attacks in Italy. And, you know, I know for some uh, uh, in the audience, this, this might sound very far-fetched, but I, I look at very specific terrorist attack in Italy, and I think it's relevant also uh, within the larger context of the 9-11 research that we look at these facts. Um, so please travel with me from Cuba now to Italy. Um, Operation Gladio is a term that maybe not everybody knows, um, but it, it, it became of some prominence in the 1919s. There was a, um, a terror attack in the Italian town called Peteano. Now, Peteano is a very small town. Nobody knows it um, outside of, of, of Peteano, probably. <laughs> and uh, it killed only um, three policemen. Now, you know, people might go, oh, gee, why should I bother to, to look at something like that? Three people killed, you know, some, some 48 years ago. I, I don't care. But it's very interesting to go into this detail. Um, this is the, the scene of the attack, and um, there's also the cover of my book. It's called NATO Secret Armies, Operation Gladio and Terrorism in Western Europe. Um, there's, there are more details for people who are interested in, um, in, in Operation Gladio. But the main point is that on that day, there was a little car. It's the Fiat uh, 500, five, Fiat 500. It's really a very small car um, because, you know, Italian cities are small and you need a small car to, to drive through them. And, they had a little car standing there and then there was an anonymous phone call to police which said hey there's an abandoned car here we don't know what it is can you please go and check it out so the police said okay yes thanks and uh, they went there and they opened the car and then the car exploded uh, and three um, policemen died and then after this terrorist attack on the italian police um there was another call um, which said, you know, we are the Red Brigades, which was a left-wing terrorist organization in Italy. And they said, we did it. So in Italy at the time, it's a long time ago in the 70s, everybody was going crazy. People said, ah, oh, you know, uh, the communists, the left, uh, they, they're dangerous. If you, if, you, if you fast forward in your brain, you know, after 9-11, everybody was going, oh, the Muslims, Al-Qaeda, they're dangerous. And if you fast forward to today, today, it's really Corona, the virus, it's dangerous. So really the fear can change from communism to Muslims to virus, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, it was all over the media. And only many, many years later, we found out who had carried out this terrorist attack. It was uh, Vincenzo Vinciguerra. And the funny thing is, he's not from the left, he's from the right. Okay, he's from a group which is called Ordine Nuovo, and see, he says, I have killed the three policemen in Peteano. I was fighting against the state, so the Italian state, but the state manipulates us. He destabilizes the public order, so he creates chaos and fear, because he wants to stabilize the political order. This means that, you know, the, the, the political parties which are in power at the time were the Democrazia Cristiana, um, that those parties stay in power and that no communists come into power. The secret services knew after the attack of Peteano that I was responsible. So the Italian military secret service, they knew that he was responsible, but they didn't arrest him. They knew it in October 72. That's a few months after the attack. But they wanted that the terror originated from the left only, not from the right. I was a man who had to be protected. So this is Vincenzo Vinci Guerra. It's very interesting to, to listen to him. Um, and that's a testimony uh, from 1990. So at the time, you know, people in Italy were all excited and say, what's happening? What's going on in our country? We don't, we don't know what's going on. Secret forces, deep state, uh, what have you. And the Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti then had to confirm the existence of Operation Gladio on August 3, 1990. That was exactly the day, uh, the, the month when... Uh, uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, Operation um, Desert Storm then later followed in 1991, for those who remember that uh, historical context. And the Italian Senate made an investigation in, in uh, false flag strategy of tension terrorism, and they come to the conclusion, those massacres, those bombs, because there were many different massacres, those military actions had been organized or promoted or supported by men inside Italian state institutions, and as has been discovered more recently, by men linked to the structures of United States intelligence. 
Um, that was um, discovered in the year 2000, so 19 years ago now, 20 years ago, actually, sorry. Uh, reported in The Guardian at the time. And it's, it's important to understand what the military uh, technique here really is. Um, if I talk to friends about, you know, terrorism, they go, oh, terrorism is something, you know, it's just terrible. It's just crazy people who do this and, you know, and, and the state tries to fight against it. That's, you know, the normal perspective that people have. But if you look in more detail at terrorism, then you see that in some cases, the secret services are involved in sponsoring terrorism because they have to gain from it. Okay. And, and then people go, no, how can that be? Why would you kill your own population? This is really evil. And the answer really is you don't kill all. You just kill a few and the rest are totally shocked. And when they're shocked, you can move them around. Okay. You can tell them don't vote the communists because the communists carry out terrorist attacks. So this is an Italian Senate investigation and they were also shocked because it took so many years to find out the truth. It took, you know, Petiano attack was in 72. The report came out in 2000. So may, make the math, you know, it, it usually takes 28 years. It's really hard to find out false flag terrorist attacks. We call it strategy of tension, you know, create tension. And then also NATO had to react because um, the NATO um, coordinated Operation Gladio. Uh, first, NATO spokesman Jean Marcotta said on Monday, November 5, 1990, so that's 30 years ago, at SHAPE, uh, SHAPE is uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Power Europe in Belgium. He said NATO had never uh, been involved in secret warfare. And then the next day, another NATO spokesman had to explain that NATO statement of the previous day had been false. Okay, so they, you know, had to move forth and back and they were really embarrassed because Operation Gladio was top secret. It was, it was never meant to be uh, discussed publicly. Um, then NATO ambassadors, uh, ambassadors on uh, 7 November 1990 were informed behind closed doors because you have to know every country sends a NATO ambassador to, to, to uh, NATO headquarters. So, you know, the, the Germans would send somebody, the Italians, the French, the Canadians, the US, of course, the British, um, the Norwegian, etc. The Swiss are not part of NATO, so we don't have a NATO ambassador. But these ambassadors, they didn't know about Operation Gladio. They, they, they were going like, Jesus, what's going on? We don't even know about that. And uh, then um, uh, Sakur, uh, US General John Galvin had, uh, had to command, and he said, okay, Operation Gladio, yes, this exists, but we don't know what exactly he said, because it was behind closed doors. He was the Supreme Allied Commander uh, Europe. That's the highest ranking general within NATO, always a US general. And then we had Italian generals coming forward. Um, uh, at the top, you see US President Nixon. At the lower end, you say uh, Italian General Giandelio Maletti. He was the former head of the Italian counterintelligence. So counterintelligence is that part of the country which is actually responsible to protect the country from other secret services coming into your country. Okay, and so Gendalia Maletti said, very interesting quote, he said, I quote, the CIA, uh, US Secret Service, following the directives of its government, wanted to create an Italian nationalism capable of halting what it saw as a slide to the left. And for this purpose, it may have made use of right wing terrorism. So he's very cautious saying that might have happened. He didn't say that definitely happened, but, you know, he was just being cautious. And um, it's important to explain that to people who are not so much into politics. If you carry out a terrorist attacks and you blame it on, on the left, then the left um, is being weakened at the polls. That's it, basically. The impression was that the Americans would do anything to stop Italy from sliding to the left. The left means communism. There was a very, very strong communist party in, uh, in Italy uh, because they had fought against Mussolini in the Second World War. So they had a lot of respect in the Italian um, uh, population because they were clearly anti-fascists. And so, you know, they were, NATO was scared that in Italy you suddenly have communists uh, in, in, in the government. You know, Italy is a NATO state. So they didn't want to have communists in the government. And he says, don't forget that Nixon was in charge and Nixon was a strange man. So US President Nixon, uh, a very intelligent politician, but a man of rather un unorthodox initiatives. So he says, 
he doesn't really say it, but he says uh, he hints at the fact that Italy, that uh, President Nixon might have given the orders um, that the CIA carries out terrorist attacks in Italy. And you know that's that's something really, really sensitive for historic for historians to work on. But it's very important to look at that. Uh, Gendelia Maletti then said Italy has been dealt with a sort of protectorate of the United States. Uh, there are a lot of military bases still today in Italy and the um, uh, United States, they don't want that in Italy you have a strong communist uh, power. Now, you know, with the Cold War over, it's no issue anymore, but um, these terrorist attacks all happened during the Cold War. I then went into um, Italian documents. That's an Italian document from 1959. Um, it says Stato Maggiore della Difesa, which means uh, uh, Defense Ministry of Italy. Um, uh, Le Forze Speciali del CIFAR e l'Operazione Gladio, which basically means the Special Forces of the Italian Military Secret Service CIFAR and Operation Gladio. And according to this document, Operation Gladio had a twofold uh, strategic purpose. First, to operate as a so-called stay behind group in the case of a Soviet invasion and to carry out guerrilla war uh, in occupied territories. That means they were planning for, for a resistance network. So if the Soviet Union had invaded uh, Western Europe, they, you know, they would be already with guerrilla structures in all countries of Western Europe, Spain, Turkey, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Germany, everywhere. We had stay behind armies in all countries of Western Europe. That, you know, that was Operation Gladio. And they had arms, explosives and guns and even gold, many different things to, to, to be ready for an invasion. The invasion never came. The invasion never came. Uh, secondly, to carry out domestic operations in cases of emergency. And that's really interesting because it seems the historical evidence shows um, that these uh, secret armies were used to destabilize um, countries uh, with terrorism. It, nobody talks about it. You know, ask somebody on the street, do you know what Operation Gladio is? And they go like, Operation what? It's, it's not on the evening news, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do I still have time to add something on Cuba? Is that okay? Um, I've, I've yes, you sure do. You go because for it. It is very hard for people who do, who do not work in this very specialized field, which is called secret warfare, to really imagine that you can carry out terrorist attacks and blame them on somebody else. They think, no, no, this is impossible. This has never happened. It would never happen. It's just insane. It's a conspiracy theory and whatever. They, they just don't want to look at the evidence. But as historians, uh, I have to look at the evidence. And in the Cuban context, I've told you already that uh, during the 1961 operation, the B-26 um, uh, bombers were painted with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the with the flag of the Cubans, which was false flag. But this was the Bay of Pigs invasion, and it actually failed. Okay, so the the CIA was carrying out this invasion, and it didn't work. Um, thereafter, um, the Pentagon was given the task to come up with an idea how the United States could overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba because, you know, the CIA basically had messed it up. So people are thinking about, can the Pentagon maybe do it? And then, um, you know, Fidel Castro was also coming to the United States. He met uh, then Vice President uh, Richard Nixon, who, who was serving in the Eisenhower administration. So Eisenhower was the president, um, uh, Nixon was the vice president. And at that time, in, in 1962, the Eisenhower administration was already out of office and the Kennedy administration was in the White House. Um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which are the highest ranking uh, military officers in the Pentagon, um, created a plan which they called justification for US military intervention in Cuba. And what they, what they really suggested is incredible. This is called Operation Northwoods. And they said, and that's a quote again, we could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. So just to get this clear, in Cuba, the United States has a military um, a naval base. It's called Guantanamo. Everybody knows it, I guess. Um, the Cubans know it for sure. And on that base, there are American ships. And now the, the, the Pentagon said, why don't we blow up our own ship and say Fidel did it. That would really make him look stupid, or you know, people would get very furious. And this is again what we call false flag. 
Okay, this is false flag, and this is an original document of the Pentagon. Another idea um, was we could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, that's in Florida, uh, and other Florida cities, or even in Washington. So actually, the Pentagon said, yeah, why not have some terrorism in the United States? Because that would really scare people. You know, that would really frighten them. And that's what I call politics of fear. You can always create fear in a population if you want to. Um, it's called strategy of tension. It has been done before. And you can always then blame that fear on somebody else, like Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or like uh, on, on Cuban communists. So in the, in the Cold War, really, it was communism. Then after 9-11, it was the Muslims. And today, the fear really is, is, is you know, it's all around viruses. But uh, that's another story. I'm not going to go into that. And uh, I was teaching history at, at, at uh, Basel University in Switzerland. I'm not teaching there anymore now. Uh, but my students then asked me, Gee, Christ, that's really that's really really evil. Who are the guys who who you know who come up with such crazy plans? And I say, look, they, these are these are like they they look very normal, very normal guys. This is General Limnum Lemnitzer to the very left. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he was the man who who suggested we could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay. And the important thing to understand is that in military history, um, it has always been. Um, the conviction of all generals that you can kill, okay? You can you cannot have a war without killing people. So to kill is a normal thing in, in the military. And the next thing is to deceive, okay? To deceive is part of military tactics. Uh, it has been for 2,000 years. That's not limited to U.S. warfare. It's been, you know, it's, it's, it's been in, in the history books, um, yeah, since the Trojan horse. So, we're, you know, it's, it's really a long story. And... Kennedy, and that's important to remember, Kennedy stopped that plan. Okay, so Operation Northwoods was not carried out. Um, and Kennedy then was shot. He was shot in 1963 in Dallas. I'm not going to go into the assassination of Kennedy, but I have to say I respect the man a lot because he stopped that plan. He stopped Operation Northwoods. He said, we're not going to do that. And he actually, you know, he met the generals. Here is General Loris Norstadt, and here... On, on, on the very right is Lyman Lemnitzer, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Kennedy actually fired him. Now, what do you do um, if you have to fire a general who is already the highest ranking general? Where do you put him? And he put it into Europe, okay? He, he, he moved him into to NATO, uh, NATO headquarters in, in Belgium, uh, made him soccer, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. So that was a degrading, you know. If, you, if you're chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then, then you go to... Sucker, that's uh, Lemnitzer was not happy. But you know, these guys were en enemies. Kennedy basically thought that Lemnitzer is crazy, you know, blowing up American ships and blaming on Fidel Castro. He thought that's crazy. So I looked at that data a little more because it's very rare that we have um, original documents on secret warfare. And one other idea was uh, to use a plane. You know, you can blow up a ship, um, but you can also blow up a plane. And um, these planes were used in the 60s, so they they look a little old from, from today's perspective. But that, that's a passenger plane from the 1960s. And the military said, we could take a plane like that, you know, paint it exactly how it looks. And then we could take such a plane and um, replace it with a drone in midair. And, um, and, you know, we would just explode it over Cuba and say Fidel shot it down. That was really an idea. That's what they wanted to do. And I, I just want to, to run with you through the original quotes to, to close my talk, really. That's the last uh, uh, data I want to share with you. But it's, it's really something to, to keep in mind that this was, this was discussed in the 60s. Again, Operation Northwoods, um, um, point eight. It, it is possible to create an incident which will demonstrate convincingly that a Cuban aircraft has attacked and shot down a chartered civil airliner en route from the United States to either Jamaica, Guatemala, Panama, or Venezuela. And what I think is, is interesting uh, that, they, that they suggested, the, the generals in the Pentagon, the passengers could be a group of college students. <laughs> now, now think about the outrage, okay, in the United States if Fidel Castro shoots down a civilian aircraft with college students who are on the, their way to Venezuela to help the poor people there. I mean, you know, total outrage. That would be 
that that be politics of fear in, in, in a really, really strong way. But then then people go and ask me, but then who would do that? Who would who would put college students in a plane and then shoot it down? This is really this is insane. And then I say, no, 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 that's not the way you do it. You say these are college students, but actually it's members of the secret services. They board under different names. Okay, you can always board a plane if you're from the secret service with a different name. And then you take that plane, it goes up into the air, and in midair you replace it with a drone. And that's exactly what the generals suggested. They said an aircraft at Eglin Air Force Base, that's a military air force base, would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA proprietary organization in the Miami area. So the CIA just copies the air airplane. At the designated time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with the selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. So wrong names, fake names. And then the actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone. So the real aircraft will become a drone, okay? And then takeoff times, now you have two planes. One is, is real, one is fake. One, the fake is the drone. The takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft will be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. And that's now a rendezvous in midair. So if you are shopping in New York, you're never going to realize that there's a rendezvous of two planes. You know, even if you if you're on Miami Beach, you can't see that. OK, this is in the air and you have no chance to see that from the rendezvous point. So that's where the two planes meet. The passenger carrying aircraft will descend to minimal altitude and go directly into an auxiliary field at Eglin Air Force Base. Okay, so the, the, the plane with people in it will go down on the military um, uh, uh, Air Force uh, uh, Base, where arrangements will have been made to evacuate the passengers and return the aircraft to its original status. And the military then has to uh, work very quickly to just uh, cover up its traces. And then you have the drone aircraft still in the air. Meanwhile, will continue to fly the filed flight path. So. People will not realize this because the exchange of the planes in midair will happen very quickly. And then the drone continues and flies over Cuba. And when over Cuba, the drone will be transmitting on the international distress frequency Mayday. So help, help us. Stating that it is under attack by Cuban uh, MiG aircraft. So that's a Cuban uh, attack aircraft. The Cuban had this MiG aircraft. And people will just believe that this, you know, distress signal is real because the signal will be intercepted by the international system. You know, that will not be military. It will be the international system getting that information and people will go, oh, OK, there's a problem. And then the transmission will be interrupted by destruction of the aircraft, which will be triggered by radio signal. So and then the Pentagon would blow up the plane over Cuba. And this is really, you know, this is really evil. <laughs> I mean, you can do it. Obviously, everybody who has a head to think goes like, yeah, yeah, it's possible to do that. But that way you can you can really deceive everybody. And uh, and the uh, the point that I want to make is we we know from history that wars where often start with lies. That's the first point I wanted to make. I'll just give you a quick summary. Uh, Iraq war 2003 was based on lies. And I'm very sorry for the U.S. soldiers who fought there and thought Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11. He didn't have anything to do with it. One million people killed in Iraq. Very, very, very sad. And um, I want to, to explain that also the Vietnam War was based on lies. Okay, There was no attack on the Maddox on August 4, 1964. It was just lies. Johnson lied. It's very hard for people to realize that the president lied, but he did. And the third thing I want people to realize, um, if they're if they're open to that, is that you can create fear by carrying out a terrorist attack and then blame somebody who, who didn't do it. It's very hard, you know, for people who didn't do it to then say, "Hey, I didn't do it." I mean, Osama bin Laden after 9/11 said, "I didn't do it." Nobody listened to him because if you if you carry out a terrorist attack, everybody's shocked, and and this very very strong emotional feeling of shock. Uh, can then be used to manipulate the public. So that's uh, that's the news from my side. I I, I hope you found this uh, interesting. Fascinating, Daniela. They they've been doing this for a long time now. Like you have any yeah. idea how long? I mean, 
right. before the 60s, right? Yeah, I've been working, like I'm 48 now. <laughs> and I think I started when I was 25, so 23 years, yeah. I mean, these false flag operations, they, they just never seem to stop. Hey, I, I want um, your listeners to know that I have two of your books. Very good. Uh, I, I want here. That one right there. <laughs> We're going to send you guys that book, uh, two of you, if you email me right now your address and just put NATO on the email and your address and your name. Uh, the first two, we will uh, send send it to you. Contact us at ae nine one one truth dot org. So uh, we're we're giving stuff away, uh, Danielle. I'm having a lot of fun uh, doing it as well. My very apologies. Nice, very kind. What? It's very kind that you share my book with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. You're sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, by the way, folks it, it, at home. If you haven't yet donated to the Matt Campbell, uh, his effort to get a new inquest for his brother, Jeff, who was murdered in the North Tower, that's what this conference is building the $100,000 war chest for his family. All that money goes to Matt Campbell and his family uh, to uh, hire the best uh, barrister in the UK. So uh, we're $85,000 raised now. We've really got to be at $100,000. Uh, that's that's the kind of the fixed fee that we've been given. And uh, and that's our fee. And so this is all of this. Everybody who's speaking here uh, t tonight is is doing this without, uh, with gratis so that you can spend your hard-earned dollars uh, partially supporting uh, this incredible effort to get all this evidence we've been talking about now for... Um, three days and 14 years <laughs> before that. Uh, it's all now packaged and going uh, into the international court system for the first time ever. So uh, in England, uh, the UK. Daniela, I have some great questions here and uh, we're gonna try to maybe uh, say, say something, a two or three minutes uh, answer each. If we can get through all of them, they, they are awesome. Uh, w w this first viewer says, were there any changes in Italy after more light was shined on Gladio or have their media swept it under the rug? They have swept it under the rug. Hmm. There was, I mean, there were books published, but it was, most of it was in Italian. There were Senate uh, reports on it, but um, there's... You know, even in Italy, people today don't understand what happened. They have people who died in Bologna, have people who've died in, in Milano, in Piazza Fontana. I, you know, many people were killed. And so the, the, the audience, the people in Italy were very confused. You know, they were just realizing there's terrorism, you know, limbs falling apart, heads being crushed. So the, the, the fear thing is it was very, very deep. And then they didn't know, was it the left, the right, the secret services, foreign agents? They, they were just totally confused. Mm. Okay. And another one, uh, do you think waning U.S. power? Interesting thought in itself that we're waning right now. Not a thought, but uh, uh, this, this opinion and perhaps reality will result in less false flag terror. Or will some other power take over? And do the same kind of action it is a well-known strategy in military history so other you know the, the japanese when they when they uh, invaded china they blew up the railroads the mukden incidents called in the 1930s so that's a lot almost 100 years ago but um then they blew up the railroads and said the chinese did it okay uh, it was their railroad there, and so um, it's not really limited to one country it's 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 human beings who can do it um, I focus on 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 U.S. wars. Um, if you say waning, yes, possibly. I mean, Obama wanted to overthrow Assad in Syria. He failed. He, he could, couldn't do that because the Russians supported Assad. Um, uh, Trump wanted to overthrow Maduro in Venezuela. He failed. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's waning power. But, you know, small country like Switzerland, where I'm based, we're, we're like looking... If a new power steps in, will they will they be 
will they be less inclined to use false flag terrorism? And I mean, that's the question that you have. And I, I don't really believe that great powers will from themselves stop from doing that. It's really more that we as citizens must cooperate and talk about it because it's not something that you learn at school. It's not something that you learn at university. You don't even read about it in the newspapers and you don't hear it on the television. So most people don't know what false flag terrorism is. They don't know what strategy of tension is. And um, I hope that we can educate ourselves uh, to the reality of these tactics. And once you know it, once you know how it works and you have a few examples, then it's much easier to understand whoever carries it out. Uh, say it again. I'm, I'm saying even if a new power comes, you know, and, uh, and they carry out false flag terrorism, we can, we can recognize it if we know how it works. So we have to be ever vigilant and, and create our own media because as yeah. we're aware now, 95% of the mainstream media is owned by five corporations. Oh, yes. Yeah. They who, run runs those, who runs those, Daniel? <laughs> oh, I couldn't tell. No, I couldn't tell. I just, I just see that the international media system is not helping the peace movement. They're not. I mean, people don't want wars. They don't want lies. But uh, we, get, we get fed so many lies. It's incredible. It's incredible. And if you don't realize that, then then it's time to wake up and say, um, why, you know, why we don't want these wars. And even if you're a soldier and you come back from Iraq and you served there and uh, you realize that you were sent there based on lies or Afghanistan or many years ago, if you fought in the Vietnam war, and then you understand that the Gulf of Tonkin was a lie. Wow. That, that is really, really brutal on, on all of, of, of those soldiers, because I, I met a few soldiers and they usually think, that they're doing something good, you know, defend democracy or fight for human rights. And when they find out that they were lied to, it's it's very sad. And it's sad for the people who are killed in these countries. Excellent point. Well, OK, here's this next viewer. Uh, hit it right on the money, too. Why don't countries rat each other out? For instance, 9-11. If China and Russia are really rivals with the USA, why don't they say something about it being a U.S. op? Um, Iran once said something, Ahmadinejad in the United uh, Nations General Assembly said something, he wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't too precise and maybe he was not the right man to make the comment. Um, but uh, Gaddafi said something once, uh, Gaddafi who uh, um, was the president of Libya and then uh, was attacked in 2011 and killed. Um, attacked by by uh, Obama and uh, French President Sarkozy and uh, British Prime Minister Cameron. Um, so question really is what the Chinese and and uh, and the Russians, you know, why don't they, you know, blow the whistle and say we we uh, we know what happened on 9-11. Here are the facts. I mean, it's a, it's a very valid question. But you always have to keep in mind that the the US also has uh, secrets on Russia and China. So you know, they all have pressure files on the other one. It's a round robin blackmail then. Ah, yeah, it is. That's why people aren't in jail that should be in jail, politicians in this country. Yeah, I mean, you know, people who attack other countries and kill people there should be in jail. Yes, very much so. But they're not. They're very powerful. They're much more powerful. You, Richard, here are collecting, you know, $100,000. They print the money, okay? They print the money themselves. <laughs> And we struggle to raise enough money to do. Yeah. Um, you know what, Richard? I think it's just important that between the time that you're born and you die, you just just, just try to do the right thing. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're born into a very high power position or whether you're in the lower medium rank like us two. Even mm -hmm. if you're in the lower medium rank, you have the same challenge, you know. Until you die, do the right thing because you're going to die anyway. And uh, I, I have decided that I don't want these lies and I don't want these wars. So I educate people on these topics and whoever wants to listen is uh, welcome to. And in addition to that, this viewer wants to know, it sounds like from your presentation, like lies and staged events are a regular part of doing business by governments. What is your solution? And, and what do you think w the rest of us should be doing uh, so that these practices can be stopped one idea is that you don't go to war after a terrorist attack keep in mind that september 11 2001 happened and then there was no investigation really 
Um, and three weeks later, on 7 October 2001, uh, the US attacked Afghanistan. In three weeks, you can't have an investigation. So I'm always saying, if there is a terrorist attack, stop for a moment and don't start bombing another country, okay? That's, you know, point one. Point two really is to understand that we're now 7.7 .7 billion human beings on, the, on this planet and that everybody belongs to the human family. It's very important not to exclude anybody. And, and this is difficult. I know it's difficult, but the media always tells us that in that and that and that country, there are evil people. And if they are killed, the world is going to be a better place. Now, that's all nonsense and it's all lies. We can't, I think, go through the 21st century, you know, bombing and killing other people just because the media tell us they, they are evil. OK, it's always been the same. The media tell us. Uh, people in Afghanistan are evil and they're they're responsible for 9/11. And then you know you have a war there, or you have the same thing in Libya, and 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 so this is really the pattern that I see that you always should, um, if possible, um, remind yourself uh, that other people, wherever they live, whatever color they have, um, whatever how much whether they're rich or poor, men or female, whether they're Muslims, Jews or Christians or even atheists or or Buddhists, doesn't really matter. They just, they just don't want to be killed. <laughs> they just don't want to be killed. <laughs> oh, beautiful. And, and, right. and this is something I stress. I stress that a lot. I'll take you back down the rabbit hole. Uh, I, I love that, though. I, we're going we're gonna to come back to that. W what kind of uh, past deep state operations in Russia, like you're talking about, were exposed after the fall of the USSR? Interesting question. Good question. Actually, I can't. I can't give you any specific details on that one. I mean, what was interesting is with the, that the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan in '79. Um, that that was one of the important operations uh, in Soviet history. Um, but that was not after the fall of the USSR. But that you know, it's interesting to see that uh, Brzezinski said in in a later quote that the CIA had armed the mujahideen already in summer '79. Uh, and and he, he then told to President Carter, this will trigger a Soviet invasion. And and then in December 79, that invasion came. And, and you know, so the Soviets have, have used similar techniques, I guess. Um, but I couldn't I couldn't give you an example for the time period after 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. There's, yeah. there's debate about um, uh, about the Chechen war, how it started with uh, buildings in Moscow collapsing. There's a debate on that one. But I'm not a specialist on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you think that they could get away with pulling off another false flag terrorist attack today, the U.S. in the U.S. and and w would they get the same kind of compliance from Congress and the American people? Yes. Yes. I think. Yeah. If 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 the shock is very big, people like Richard are going to say, "Wait, no, don't." <laughs> And he's going to raise 50,000 or so. But, you know, they, these guys, they play with billions. And they, they own the networks and they create the stories they want to tell. So they create the stories themselves. If, if you, for instance, take uh, Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941, I've, I've looked at the details and uh, I'm totally convinced that President Roosevelt knew that the attack was coming. But he didn't tell the commanders in Hawaii, that was Admiral Kimmel and the General Short, he didn't tell them the Japanese were coming. So these generals were totally surprised. And um, uh, before the attack, uh, Roosevelt made sure that the two aircraft carriers of the US were moved out of Pearl Harbor because they were important. So they moved them to Midway. And, you know, it's, it's all a game. It's all a game. What you get at the end is, oh, there was a surprise attack in Pearl Harbor. And it was not. It was not a surprise attack for Roosevelt. It was just a surprise attack for the American people. Mm. And so, yes, I think you could pull it off again in 2025, I think. I think more people are now aware that false flag terrorism is a reality. Uh, more people are aware that wars are based on lies. And more people are becoming aware that you don't have to blindly believe what CNN and Fox News and all the other stations tell you. So people are in a, in a waking up process, but it's painful. It's quite painful. I have people who told me, I don't want to know all that. I don't, I just don't want to know it. Give me some football or tennis or let me alone with that stuff. And, you know, I can, I can also understand it because it's, 
it's hard to understand, it's hard to realize uh, that we're being lied to and that our emotions like fear and hate are being manipulated yeah that's hard it is really hard last question for you daniela um I saw a headline a few days ago where they claimed Trump would be pulling troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan. How long have we been hearing that? They also claimed this is the longest war in U.S. history, by the way, in Afghanistan. Isn't oh, that yes, it is. 19 years. Um, yeah, they also claimed this was happening under Obama. How seriously should we take these announcements? And do you think we are actually scaling these wars down? I hope. I hope, but uh, I, I see the same announcements time and time again. And then, you know, a few months later, you check and there are still troops there. Uh, so that is the withdrawal thing is always difficult. But I'm convinced that the United States uh, is losing the war in Afghanistan. The German uh, forces are losing the war in Afghanistan. They're also up there. And a few other countries are up there, but the Afghanis are going to win. They're going to win. They're, they don't want any foreign troops in their country, like the Vietnamese. They don't want. Uh, they didn't want any foreign troops. And, and this, is, this is sometimes hard to understand that, you know, um, a military, which, which, you know, has like some $730 billion, <laughs> cannot win against a very poor country. But you always have to um, remind yourself of the fact that the people who, who fight in Afghanistan, they actually live there. Okay, they're not going to go away. They live there and they don't want any foreign troops. They just don't want them. I'm not saying uh, they run the country in a perfect manner, but the important thing to understand is that every country has the right for national sovereignty and run the country in the way they want. It's not right to always go in other countries and overthrow the government and kill the people. It's it's not something we should be doing all the time. But yeah, I don't know when the troops are all home, but I hope soon. Uh, why don't you finish real quick, but by telling us a little bit about the Swiss Institute for Peace. Uh, how are we creating peace in the world with your institute? <laughs> I just always um, focus on the United Nations Charter. You know, it was uh, after Second World War, after Hiroshima, Nagasaki, after Auschwitz and all, you know, all the 60 million dead of the World War II, the United Nations were created. And then people came together and they said, gee, you know, this is all madness. Why are we killing each other all the time? And then they signed the United Nations Charter. And the charter, in the charter, it says, um, that's uh, uh, in Ar Article 2, it says, <clears throat> uh, all nations shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. Okay, that's a quote. And now if we did that, you know, if no country would attack another country, then we would really make a huge progress. And that's really at the center of this little institute that I created. I was uh, formerly working at uh, Swiss universities, but then when I said World Trade Center 7 was probably blown up, I had great difficulties to, you know, continue working uh, at the, these different Swiss universities. So the topic here in Switzerland is also very delicate. And then I said, well, and then I just create a little institute outside of university because the freedom of research and the freedom of speech are very, very important. And I know that many people in the United States are also very much committed to freedom of research and freedom of speech. And I, I really thank architects and engineers uh, for 9-11 Truth for keeping up the work for, for such a long time. I mean, you guys are doing a tremendous, important job. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. It, it's incredible to be working with you two in tandem around the world as we've been able to do. Uh, so let's keep at it. Uh, we've got a very important message and I know our, our viewers are so grateful to you for bringing us this wisdom. And uh, my, my hat's off to you, my friend, and uh, we'll catch up again really soon. I just know it. Thank you, Richard. All the best and thanks for doing this conference. Very good work.